Okay, here we have uh, group three, and we need to know about the oxides uh, of the elements in group three, and so group three, period three, and how uh, that changes as you go across the group, across the period, sorry. Okay, so we've got, um, all right, you, well, let's look at the formula of them. Sodium oxide, sodium forms a one plus ion, the oxide ion is T minus, so Na2O. Magnesium is MgO, so you can see a pattern developing as Sodium is half an oxygen per atom. Magnesium is one oxygen per atom. Pattern continues. Aluminium oxide, you have one and a half, so it's Al2O3. And with silicon dioxide, two oxygens for the silicon. It carries on with phosphorus, you get two and a half. Phosphorus forms P4O10. Um, sulfur does form SO3, but it also forms SO2. So the pattern goes a little bit there, SO3. Chlorine forms a whole load of different oxides, lots of them. And we don't need to know about that. And argon doesn't obviously react. Okay, so we can forget about those. The so group seven and group zero at the end. Um, right, now we need to think about uh, the bonding. Um, right, so uh, the bonding in um, sodium oxide is ionic. Uh, magnesium is ionic as well. Now. Uh, obviously because they always form ionic compounds. Aluminium can form some covalent compounds and but aluminium oxide is ionic it, um, and the sort of the test for that would can it conduct electricity when molten and it can as we know because that's how you extract aluminium from its ore by electrolysis um, but there is quite a bit of distortion a bit of covalent character there if you've done the um, Born Harbor topic and compared the theoretical and real lattice enthalpy values. Um, aluminium is quite a small, highly charged ion, of course, some polarization. Um, silicon dioxide is giant covalent. If you remember from GCSE even and for during A level, giant covalent. Uh, silicon likes to form four bonds, so uh, you have a silicon bonded to four oxygens. So that will be tetrahedral shape, and each one of those is bonded to another silicon, and that pattern just carries on, uh, forms a giant covalent structure. Um, incidentally, that's you know, if you look at what's the other group for oxide, we know is carbon dioxide, and that's completely different bonding in that because in that case, you form two double bonds, and that means you don't get a giant covalent structure, you get a uh, simple covalent. And carbon dioxide's got a very low melting point, silicon dioxide, uh, very high melting point. Um, sorry, let's get rid of this. Uh, then if we think about four, P4O10, that is a simple covalent. So it's not a giant molecule, simple covalent. P4O10 is a solid at room temperature. Um, quite a big, mole well, it's, it's, it's a big-ish molecule, so Van der Waals forces are going to be fairly strong. Uh, SO2 and SO3, they're both simple covalent. Okay, now are you wondering about the bonding in phosphorus uh, P4O10? Well, it's we have four phosphoruses, and they're bonded with oxygens like this. And each phosphorus has a double bonded oxygen. A phosphorus usually forms five bonds. Uh, they're only forming four, and that's because this, they haven't, this two haven't drawn. So these two phosphorus will be linked by an oxygen. And I'll do this in a different color. And these two are going to be linked by an oxygen. That just obviously doesn't give any, any, any idea of the three-dimensional structure of that molecule, but that's what the bonding is in P4O10. Um, right, we need to know about how those... Uh, elements react with oxygen. Um, so sodium will burn with, it will burns with an orange flame. Um, magnesium, aluminium and silicon and phosphorus, they all burn with a bright, with bright white flames. Uh, aluminium is quite hard as a unless it's powdered if it's powdered it catches fire quite easily 
um, the aluminium as a lump is hard to set fire to it. And uh, sulfur that burns with a blue flame. And when it does burn, it always makes SO2, it doesn't make SO3. It burns in air. Okay, so that's that sorted out. The next thing we need to do is think about the, uh, oh, let's just, the, the trend as we go across then, you can see you start off on this side is ionic, and it gets a little bit of covalent character with aluminium. Aluminium oxide's got a bit of covalent and it becomes covalent as you go across the the uh, the period as you're going from the metals form um, ionic compounds over to the uh, non-metals forming covalent compounds. Um, the, the main thing that this topic is uh, we're interested in here are the acid base properties of these oxides. Um, and I'll briefly summarize that now. So I'll um, get rid of some of this, I think. Okay, now, when we're talking about, if I say they're an acid, obviously they must be Lewis acids. They can't be Bronsted Lowry because they can't be that because Bronsted Lowry, that means it's an H plus H plus donor. Obviously, there's no hydrogen in any of those. So when we're talking about acids, we mean they are Lewis acids. Remember, Lewis acids are lone pair acceptors. Okay, so sodium oxide is you, it will dissolve in in water to form a solution of pH 14. It's very uh, alkaline, okay? So it will dissolve in water. pH 14, okay? Now magnesium solid is very sparingly soluble, hardly react uh, with water at all, uh, hardly dissolve in water. We'll react with a little bit of water and it forms like a solution of like pH 9. We'll see why that is in a minute. Aluminium oxide is insoluble in water, but it will dissolve in acid and alkali. So we would probably say that this is amphoteric. It's got both acidic and basic properties. Uh, silicon dioxide is insoluble in water, obviously because it's sand, but it will dissolve in um, NaOH and it is considered to be acidic. P4O10, right, that's soluble in water, very soluble. And it will give you a pH of about one or zero. It's a strong acid. Uh, SO3, that will dissolve in water to give pH of about one. SO2, we'll do this in more detail a bit later. That gives a pH, it forms a weak acid, and it's about pH uh, three or four. Okay, so again, we're getting another trend as we go across. We're going from basic oxides, and we have an amphoteric in the middle. Um, to becoming acidic oxides. And also, you know, we say silicon dioxide is acidic, but it won't dissolve in water, it, but it will dissolve in very concentrated sodium hydroxide, whereas it's, um, SO3 and P4O10 are more, more strongly acidic than that. So we do get a trend as we go across. Right, let's have a look at um, each one individually then. Okay, let's look at sodium oxide and why it gives a pH 14. Sodium oxide is obviously made up of the Na plus ion and the oxide ion. Now, when you dissolve, if you dissolve sodium oxide in water, it, uh, you can never have oxide ions. You can't have these in aqueous solution. And the reason why you can't is because they're very, very strong bases. They're very good at accepting um, H plus ions. If we have a little think about, we know a really strong base is hydroxide ions, okay, or hydroxide ions. 
OH minus. Oxide, will that be a stronger base? Well, it will be. It will be stronger. Why? Well, because it's two, it's better at, uh, better at attracting H plus ions because it is two minus, not just one minus. So oxides ions are such strong bases, they will react with water. When you put them into water, they you never just get them floating around by themselves in aqueous solution. Uh, so O2 minus will react with water. Uh, it will pull a proton off the water, forming one OH and leaving another OH minus behind. Okay, so that's what happens when you put sodium oxide in water. It reacts very readily uh, and you'll form a solution of sodium hydroxide, which of course very alkaline, pH 14. So depending on the concentration, obviously, but and if you have any significant amounts of it, it's going to be very alkaline. Right, now magnesium oxide. Let's do magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide, when you dissolve it in water, it won't dissolve in water. It doesn't really dissolve. Uh, but a tiny bit of it will react. And so it's insoluble. So it will make the pH of the water about uh, 8 or 9 because a tiny, tiny bit will react with water. As I said, oxide ions will, you can't have them in aqueous solution, but they do tend to react with water. And I'm going to draw um, uh, funny equilibrium symbol there. The, the backwards arrow is going much, is much bigger than the forwards arrow. It just means this equilibrium is way over to the left. It hardly, you hardly get any magnesium hydroxide at all. You get a little bit of that dissolved. It's not very soluble. And that there's enough OH minus ion in solution uh, to make it like pH eight or nine, as we say. Okay. So if you get some magnesium, some magnesium oxide and you put it in water, it looks like none of it's dissolved, but you can tell something has happened because if you put a bit of a universal indicator in there, it will go from being um, green to being greeny blue, showing you know you've got pH eight or nine. All right, let's get on to aluminium now, which is the tricky one, because of course it is amphoteric. Okay, so um, so aluminium oxide, and because this video is going to be quite long, otherwise I'm going to stop after aluminium and do uh, sulfur and uh, phosphorus in the and then silicon in the next one. Right, so aluminium oxide, it's amphoteric. It won't dissolve in water, but it will react with acids and with alkalides. Right, let's say with acids, first of all. Now this is, with acids, it's quite easy. It's, it's how we all metal oxides react with acids. So most metal oxides, so for example, if you get copper oxide and you've done this, it's like a, it's a required practical in GCSE making copper sulfate. If you react that with sulfuric acid, copper oxide is, is a typical metal oxide. It is basic. Uh, you'll get copper sulfate and you'll get water. Okay, so, you know, the water comes from the, hydrogens of the acid and the oxide ion oxide or the oxygen in the copper oxide now in, in aluminium oxide you get exactly the same thing happening there so you get a it's this is just uh, very straightforward so you get aluminium oxide and if we add um, let's do sulfuric acid I'm going to do an ionic equation here let's so we've got al3 plus ions um, that's going to react with the, sorry, it's an ionic equation, but I'll leave out this, this sulfate spectator line. So aluminium oxide is going to react with H plus and you're going to form two Al3 plus ions in solution and you're going to get three H2Os. So to balance that, I need to put a six there. Right, if I write the full equation, then you're going to get aluminium sulfate, which is a bit of an awkward formula, Al2SO4 three times, because you've got a two minus charge 
on the sulfate and the three plus on the aluminium. And you're going to get H2Os. Let's balance that. So I need a three there and I'm going to form three H2Os. So that there's, there's nothing difficult about that. That's just the way we know that all metal oxides react with acids. The difficult bit is because um, alum, aluminium oxide will also react with alkalis. Okay. And that is most metal oxides will not. Okay, so if you get aluminium oxide and you react it with some, uh, I'll draw it as an ionic equation first of all, some OH minus ions. You're also going to need a bit of water, we'll see, for this to balance. And you form this substance, Al OH4 minus. Now I'll just balance that equation before saying a little bit more about Al OH4 minus. So we need two of those. Right now we've got two negative charges on this side of the equation and only one there. So that means we're definitely going to have to balance it by putting a two in front of the OH minus. Now, how many waters are we going to need? We have got eight, sorry, H's on this side and we've only got two there. So that means we need six in the water. So we need to put a three in front of the water in order to balance it. That's a tricky equation to balance. I'd probably memorize that. Because if you're trying to write it in an exam, then you usually forget and waste time. Okay. So that's if I if I, if I did want to write it as a full equation, I'd obviously do it as two NaOH. Um, and this would be sodium aluminate, Na, two lots of Na. Al OH4. Right, let's just have a little closer look at this Al OH4 thing. Okay, what this really is, it's shorthand for something which we've come across before, especially if you're under section 2.6, ions in aqueous solution. Uh, aluminium, when it's in aqueous solution, it forms the hexaqua. Yeah. Uh, and if you replace uh, four of those waters with OH minuses, then you get Al H2O2. And that will have a negative charge on it, that complex. So hopefully if you've done that bit of the spec already, you, you'll be familiar with this. So when I write Al, when we write Al OH4, it's shorthand really for this complex iron here. And if you look at that video on that, which if you said that Actually, um, aluminium, we talked about aluminium um, showing amphoteric behavior there um, as well. Uh, we talked about the, uh, if you get this complex, AlH2O3, OH3, so you've got that, that's a precipitate. You get that if you add sodium hydroxide to aluminium ions in solution. Right, this is amphoteric because if you add alkali, it turns into that. If you add acid, it turns back into the hexaqua complex. So we have talked about aluminium being amphoteric beforehand. So um, yeah, aluminium is the tricky one. Um, this is the equation you need to know. How it reacts with alkalis, it will dissolve in alkali. Uh, reacting with acids, I'd say that's more straightforward. That's just what normal um, metal oxides do. Okay, um, and we'll leave that there and in the next video we'll discuss silicon phosphorus sulfur.